subcommittee on state and foreign operations and related programs will come to order. Well, good morning. First of all, let me uh, start by welcoming our administrator, uh, Samantha Power, back to our subcommittee. Nice to see you today. And uh, the hearing is uh, fully virtual. And so we need to uh, first address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If you or I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your, your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies during the Q and A, and we're gonna to try to stick with our five minutes. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen uh, that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I may gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. After Administrative Power uh, presents her testimony, we will follow the order of recognition set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time, the hearing is called to order, will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time of the hearing um, will be called to order. That's uh, in terms of how, how the lineup will, will happen. Finally, house rules require me to remind you that we have set up uh, an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been uh, provided uh, to you in advance and also to your staff. So uh, I will uh, start by once again, welcoming um, our administrator, Samantha Power, to our subcommittee on state foreign operations and related programs. Your agency, the USAID, is America's lead international development agency supporting people around the world to build safe, prosperous, equitable, and inclusive societies. The talented, and the knowledge, knowledgeable and the passionate people uh, at USAID are on the front lines each and every day helping to save lives and advance human rights and dignity. And their sense of professionalism and duty and patriotism is, is unmatched by anyone. And so we are very grateful to have your leadership and expertise at the helm of USAID and that you're joining us today. This morning, we will discuss the administration's fiscal 2023 budget request for USAID. And as I said to Secretary of State Blinken during our recent hearing, I believe our international affairs budget should be equal to, if not greater than our military budget. That's my personal opinion. Our military tools should be used as the last resort, whereas foreign assistance resources that we provide are the best and most effective tools we have to address today's most pressing challenges as well as to build a more just and inclusive and peaceful world. I've long argued that our foreign assistance is critical to achieving the sustainable development goals, especially in terms of eradicating poverty, protecting the planet and promoting peace and prosperity. The COVID-19 pandemic and its many secondary effects have made achieving these goals by 2030 all the more difficult while ongoing climate shocks and disasters threaten our development goals even before the pandemic. And so I'm eager to hear from you, Administrative Power, on how we will achieve the SDGs this decade and how USAID's programs are both contributing to and measuring progress toward them. The fiscal 23 request includes notable increases for humanitarian, global health, climate, and accountable governance programs. It also makes bold commitments to gender equity and equality, recognizing ongoing injustices felt by half of the population who disproportionately bears the burden of poverty, poor health, violence, and climate change. The request also includes a modest increase in food security, but I fear it will not be enough to avert a global food crisis, which experts, including yourself and administrative power have warned is another catastrophic effect of Russia's devastating war in Ukraine. I know you have made several trips to the region and I have recently returned from Poland myself and like you, 
heard firsthand about the devastating impact this inexcusable war is having on individuals and communities. Given the scope and the scale of the crisis, it's clear that there is no quick fix. Our NGO partners in the United Nations community are doing heroic work and scaling up quickly. Most had no presence in Ukraine outside of the Donbas and neighboring countries before February. While there is already more to do and improvements to be made, this is a humanitarian response like no other and it prevents both an opportunity and a challenge to think differently and work in full partnership within structures that already exist. And with your background and decades of experience in advocating for human rights, you are uniquely qualified to assess and report on the human costs of this crisis and other conflicts around the world. I would appreciate hearing your perspective on the never ending demands on our humanitarian assistance and what changes you've implemented at USAID that have improved our response. As Congress works through our fiscal 23 bills and considers additional emergency resources, such as those passed by the House yesterday or last night for Ukraine, wanna know if you have the tools and authorities you need to stretch resources beyond the emergency response. And what is the US doing to urge other countries to step up as well? During your short but impactful time thus far at USAID, you have also prioritized locally led development by supporting leaders and partner countries to play the lead role in shaping and implementing a system. I agree that uh, to be enduring, our development efforts must be defined and led by those local actors. I'm eager to discuss the targets that you've set to put local organizations in the driver's seats. We'll be watching for evidence of significant progress in this effort over the next few months. Also, you've instituted an agency-wide focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, both in Washington and USAID missions and programs. And you've named a new chief diversity officer to oversee policy changes and hold you accountable. And so I applaud these efforts uh, and I look forward to hearing an update on the progress you've made so far toward a more diverse and inclusive USAID workforce. Last but certainly not least, I also hope you will provide us an update on our response to the COVID-19 pandemic around the world, especially vaccine delivery and dis distribution. Last week, the World Health Organization released its new estimate of coronavirus deaths globally of 15 million, which is a stunning figure. As a fierce advocate for additional funding for international efforts like you, I'm outraged by the partisan refusal to help the rest of the world recover as we in the United States try to do so in our own country. This is not only morally unacceptable, but also strategically counterproductive. We have ample evidence that new variants do not respect borders or political beliefs. And so Administrator Power, I hope in your testimony, you will remind the members of this subcommittee just how dire the situation will become if the United States suddenly stops leading the world in combating COVID-19. I'll now turn to our ranking member, Mr. Rogers, for his opening statement. I wanna thank you again, Administrator Power, for being here today. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome, Administrator Power. Good to see you again. I appreciate your being here uh, to provide testimony and answer questions on the uh, fiscal 23 budget request for USAID. Let me start by uh, once again acknowledging the good work being done by the foreign and civil servants at USAID. In particular, I want to express my appreciation to you and your colleagues for your robust response to the crisis in Ukraine uh, and its ripple effects around the region, indeed around the world. In these extraordinary times, it's important that we acknowledge your dedicated cadre of development professionals that too often are working in or near dangerous uh, circumstances. Turning to the matter at hand, uh, the president's budget request for fiscal 23 for the uh, state foreign operations bill is 65.77 billion, which is an increase of 9.678 billion over enacted. The request for USAID administered accounts is 29.4 billion. In broad strokes, the state foreign operations budget looks 
fairly similar to what was requested last year. As I noted during our hearing with Secretary Blinken, it represents a, a significant increases that we can't afford and that are not realistic. In my judgment, it's important that the administration focuses on matters that are essential to US national security and avoid funding commitments that are above and beyond the resources the Congress can provide. The credibility of the United States will be further diminished if our commitments uh, outstrip our means. But Madam Administrator, I urge you to keep this in mind as you work with your interagency colleagues on what new initiatives and funding commitments will be announced uh, this year. There are more priorities that uh, I'll get to in my questions. So in closing, let me thank you for your time today and for your continued service to our country. And I thank the chair and yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Administrative Power, now if you could summarize your oral statement in less than five minutes, I wanna make sure we have enough uh, time to get our questions. Uh, your full statement, of course, will be included in the record. And after your testimony, I will be calling on members based on seniority of the members that were present when the hearing was called to order, alternating between majority and minority members. I will then recognize any remaining members in the order of their appearance. Each member is asked to please keep their questions to within five minutes uh, per round. And if in fact the um, chair of the appropriations or a ranking member uh, arrive, uh, I will definitely yield to them because they are in several hearings themselves. So good to see you again and Ms. Administrative Power, uh, please proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Rogers and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's good to be back. Um, just to sort of frame the discussion that I hope we can have over the next couple of hours, uh, I'd just like to start by saying that I don't think it is an overstatement to say that we are gathered here at a profound juncture in history. Uh, for 16 straight years, we've seen the number of people living under democratic rule decline. The world is now less free and less peaceful than at any point since the Cold War. And for several years, as we're seeing uh, vividly and graphically and horrifically right now, autocracies have grown increasingly brazen on the world stage, claiming that they can get things done for their people with a speed and effectiveness that democracies cannot match. Today, we see just how empty that rhetoric is and just how dark the road to autocracy can be. From Vladimir Putin's brutal war on a peaceful neighbor in Ukraine to the People's Republic of China's campaign of genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. Now, when autocracies are on their back heel is the moment for the world's democracies to unite and take a big step forward after so many years of losing ground. If the world's free nations with the United States in the lead are able to unite the efforts of our allies, the private sector, to mobilize our multilateral institutions and marshal the resources necessary to help our partner nations, we have a chance to extend the reach of peace, prosperity, and human dignity to billions more. This has been USAID's mission since its inception six decades ago, and I'm truly grateful to you for your continued bipartisan support for our efforts to save lives, to strengthen economies, to prevent fragility and conflict, to promote resilience, and to bolster freedom around the world. USAID's work is a testament to the fact that America cares about the plight of others, that we can competently accomplish mammoth goals that no other country can, and that the work we do abroad also matters to Americans here at home. It makes us safer, it makes us more prosperous, and it engenders goodwill that strengthens alliances and global cooperation and creates a better future for the generations to come. Thanks to your past support, the United States has helped get more than half a billion COVID-19 vaccines to people in 115 countries. We have led life-saving humanitarian and disaster responses in 68 countries, including Haiti, Ethiopia, and Ukraine. We've helped enhance pathways for legal migration to the US while working to strengthen worker protections. 
and we've assisted the relocation and resettlement of Afghan colleagues and refugees under the most dire of circumstances while pivoting our programming in Afghanistan to address ongoing food insecurity and public health needs and continuing to push to keep women and girls in school. We're also making strides to become much more nimble at a time of immense demands, shoring up a depleted agency by welcoming new recruits and operating with greater flexibility. The Biden-Harris administration's FY 2023 discretionary request of $29.4 billion will build on these steps forward, giving us the ability to invest in the people and systems to meet the world's most significant challenges so the United States can seize this moment in history. Last night, thanks to your bipartisan leadership, the House of Representatives took a major step in that direction by passing a nearly $40 billion package for Ukraine. Yet the challenges we face are significant. Putin's war has displaced more than 13 million people, including two thirds of Ukraine's children. It has led to serious disruptions to global food, fuel and fertilizer supplies around the world, further taxing an already overwhelmed international humanitarian system. Two difficult years of the COVID-19 pandemic have set back development gains. And despite US leadership in vaccinating the world, the job remains unfinished. Multi-billion dollar climate shocks appear each year with more frequency and continued humanitarian crises remain in Ethiopia and elsewhere. Yet as grave as the challenges are, I sincerely believe the opportunity before us is even larger. By pro providing the resources necessary to seize this moment, the United States can galvanize commitments from our allies and private sector partners, demonstrate to the world that democracies can deliver in a way that autocracies cannot, and these actions are the key to reversing years of democratic decline and creating a more stable, peaceful, prosperous future for people at home and abroad. With your support, USAID will move aggressively to grasp this opportunity to build a brighter future for us all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Administrator Power. I will start now uh, and I'll try to summarize my questions very quickly. Um, First of all, until the world's vaccinated, uh, American citizens will continue to be faced with the possibility of future and more deadly viruses uh, in terms of deadly variants. Uh, it's essential that we ramp up the deployment and delivery of vaccines in Africa and around the world. So what do you see as the consequences of Congress not providing emergency supplemental to deploy vaccines already purchased and not reaching the 70% goal vaccination target what do you expect to come out of, of the discussions in terms of the second global summit? And uh, how will uncertainty around global VAX and US efforts limit our leadership? Uh, and with regard to the Caribbean, just wanna ask you, because I just returned from a conference with parliamentarians in the Caribbean, uh, and they voiced over and over uh, their inability to access global climate assistance and financing due to being classified upper to middle income countries. And of course, they feel very um, left out uh, and our partnerships have not been strengthened in the Eastern Caribbean like it should have been uh, with US support and alliances. So what more can USAID do to help our Caribbean neighbors address the barriers to assistance and financing and better combat the effects of these storm, storms in the climate uh, crisis, recognizing their specific, mind you, vulnerability as small island nations, which really are very low income and poor, given the devastation of the hurricanes and the climate crisis. And how do you think we can better demonstrate to the people of the Caribbean uh, that the United States values their partnership? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, let me take the, the, the questions in reverse order if I can. Um, First, let me just say that just in the last month, I've had the chance to meet with the Prime Minister of Barbados and the Prime Minister of Jamaica, um, touching on exactly this kind of structural aspect of your question, namely uh, that these countries by and large fall into categories that render them ineligible for, for example, uh, investments by the Development Finance Corporation, uh, and out of the reach of the kind of scale of investment by the World Bank and other international financial institutions. So I think with the Summit of the Americas coming up, uh, we are uh, deliberating, I think, internally about what more can be done 
USAID has increased, as you know well, thanks to you and um, some of what you put in past appropriations bills, but we have uh, increased our investments through CARICOM and through other kind of regional groupings, and that has a country by country effect, for example, in, in helping Barba Barbados uh, deal with flooding, um, uh, helping ensure the creation of a catastrophe bond in Jamaica, uh, which I think, you know, helps uh, the country uh, build its resilience uh, to the kinds of climate shocks that are ever more prevalent in the region. Uh, but there's no question that USAID financing alone without some of these other tools uh, will uh, will not um, give the countries what they need to, to endure what's coming at them and more and more every year. I could pivot because I know I don't have a lot of time uh, to the ever so important issue of uh, COVID vaccination. First to step back and to just say it's working. We are getting shots in arms. Uh, the statistics are really, really striking. Uh, when President Biden had his last summit uh, on COVID back in September, when he sought to rally the world around vaccinating the world, when we finally had supply coming online, when he announced that we were going to be donating a billion Pfizer uh, doses, we were in, in lower and lower middle income countries at 13% vaccination coverage. Today, we are at 52% in lower and lower middle income countries. Why stop when we have now the vaccines and the supply being brought online, arriving in ports, and what we need is the assistance to get those shots in arms. It requires everything from strengthening cold chain uh, storage to addressing what I think is the biggest issue that goes even beyond vaccine resistance or vaccine hesitancy, which is risk perception. People just believing, well, I've lived with COVID now for two years without a vaccine. You know, I've got five bigger problems, uh, including inflation and other issues that I'm sure we'll talk about. You know, why, why go that extra mile? Well, if we make vaccines more convenient and accessible, it turns out people are much more likely to get those shots in arms. And why does that matter? For the very reason that you put your finger on, which is the risk of new variants, which we are not out of the woods on, and specifically the risk of new variants as they mutate in immunocompromised people. So for, for all of the success in bringing those numbers up, the numbers are still woefully uh, low in Sub-Saharan Africa. We were just beginning to make a dent, uh, for example, in Uganda through this new initiative I launched in December called Global Vax, helping bring the first dose vaccination rates from 20% in November 2021 to 71% last month. I mean, that is what we can do just with a surge of resources. But our resources are spent. By the end of July, we will have obligated the American Rescue plan funds that were uh, dedicated to this cause, and there could not be a cause more vital for the sake of the people who have not yet been inoculated and for our own public health here at home. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Rogers, and we'll come back to, to this if we have a second round. Ranking Member Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Administrator uh, Power, uh, we uh, recently passed the emergency supplemental for Ukraine providing critical resources to many parts of our government in support of the brave people of Ukraine and our European allies and partners. With respect to the humanitarian aid, there have been criticisms that the U.S. response has been over-reliant on United Nations agencies to deliver the assistance to Ukraine. The supplemental included language emphasizing the need to engage local organizations and other NGOs outside of the UN system. What can you say about this? Are you trying to prioritize working through local groups and other non-governmental organizations, as well as faith-based groups to deliver critical aid to Ukraine? More broadly, what mechanisms uh, have we or our international partners put in place to guard against waste, fraud, abuse, and the disbursement of this assistance? Uh, thank you so much, Ranking Member Rogers. I, I, I could not be grateful for more grateful for both parts of your question uh, because they relate to one another. I think um, the rules and requirements that have been put in place over at USAID over the years in order to guard against fraud, waste, and abuse entails an awful lot of due diligence on the front end. Sometimes that process in the past has taken as long as a year. I know we don't have a year, we don't have a day uh, in terms of actually getting resources in, in it to the Ukrainian people who need it most. 
But I think if you want an account as to why there are some startup costs in actually moving toward partnering with local uh, organizations, it is actually the second part of your question. Whereas with the World Food Program, with UNICEF, with UNHCR, we have those systems in place. There is more overhead, of course, uh, that is associated uh, and, and thus more cost for those systems. But with some of the local partners we'd most like to work with, we just want to make sure that we are going to be faithful stewards of taxpayer money at the same time we are looking for speed and nimbleness. So I think the key is getting the right balance. We are shifting uh, both by pushing international organizations to themselves subcontract and provide subgrants uh, to local organizations. I think that's going to be a critical part of the solution. I think when the U.S. Uh, embassy reopens in Kyiv and our DART team is back where it belongs in the country, in the field, really scrutinizing um, the extent to which uh, these local organizations can be reliable stewards, I think we'll be able to move more quickly in that direction. And we are also looking now at a consortium arrangement uh, with an NGO that would, in a sense, be a, a kind of uh, umbrella. We would offer an umbrella grant and it would go to some of these very nimble faith-based and other local organizations on the ground. But um, on, on the, the last thing I'd say, just if I could, because um, it's so important and it's in what you did for, for the Ukrainians last night, we have come back as an administration, not as USAID per se, but asked uh, for this much larger sum in direct budget support. And I really do believe, sir, that over time, what we really want to see is Ukrainian government systems in a position to be providing, for example, the cash assistance that the World Food Program UNHCR is doing now. And they're doing it for some vulnerable groups. But what we'd like to see is whatever about this very acute emergency phase is for that, that direct budget support to go to the Ukrainians' ability through their social service ministry to be able to be meeting the needs of displaced persons, vulnerable people of all kinds. So, but that requires the kinds of strictures also that you put in the SUP last night in the language around making sure that that is done transparently, that we have the checks and balances on direct budget support so that it is actually, again, being expended in the way that you all had intended. Well, I thank you for that. Uh... That response. I have uh, some questions about uh, Afghanistan that I'll put in for the record, Madam Chair. Uh, but in the meantime, let me yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. I'll yield now to Ms. Meng. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Rogers, and thank you, Administrator Power, for your testimony here today. It's great to see you again. Thank you again for inviting me to participate in USAID's Youth and Development Policy Launch uh, event last Friday. As you know, I've been focused on making sure that the voices of young people are integrated into US foreign policy. Today, there are 2.4 billion pe young people ages uh, 10 to 29 in the world, the largest youth population in history. In countries facing conflict, it will be young people who will bear the burden of sustaining peace over generations, leading their society from reconciliation to prosperity. We must work to ensure that the U.S promotes the inclusive and meaningful participation of youth in mediation and negotiation processes that prevent, mitigate, or resolve conflict overseas. I'm especially excited to see that youth participation, including in peace building, is one of the central policy objectives of USAID's updated youth and development policy. However, it's not clear how USAID accounts for its support of youth and youth participation in its fiscal year 23 budget request. The transparent accounting of international programmatic activities for youth has always been a challenge. Funding data is not often broken down in a way to account for children and youth and demographics are not always disaggregated by age, gender, disability, minority location, and other key factors to ensure that we are reaching youth as intended. Um, Administrator Power, how will you ensure more clear and public reporting of US funded investments in these programming programs intended to benefit our children and youth? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman, and uh, this is actually the third time I think I'm seeing you in the last calendar week, uh, the youth event, and then also thank you for participating in our uh, 
uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders uh, event, uh, which was very, very powerful. Um, so on this score, we just actually launched, as you may know, our, uh, of course you know, because you were part of the event, the, uh, the USAID uh, youth, youth policy. Um, I think we, are, we do think it's very important, you can't change what you can't measure, as the old saying goes, uh, to be in a position to have uh, indicators that allow us to, to see the extent to which we are increasing our, our youth partnerships. As I stressed in my comments at the event that we both participated in, I think that it's one thing to have kind of dedicated youth programming, which we have, but it's you know a very modest amount if you look at it uh, against the backdrop of how many young people are, there are in the world. But I think the more profound aspect of this is how are we integrating youth uh, into the programming that we're doing uh, across the board. And so, for example, um, one of the commitments that I've made that, that Congresswoman Lee alluded to uh, earlier with regard to our localization agenda is about you know, ensuring that 50% of the programming that we do and the assistance that we provide out in the world uh, is co-designed or evaluated, measured, et cetera, by local actors. Well, you know, we need to ensure that youth are at the table and are part of who counts as, as local because there is a temptation to just go back to the well of the more traditional partners that we have worked with uh, over time. Uh, with regard specifically to your question about indicators, which again, you're uh, very, very immersed in this, so I'm sure you're way aware already, but I mean, we do have indicators for the number of youth trained in soft skills, life skills in US programs. We have indicators around the number of laws, policies, and procedures that USAID engagement helped bring about the adoption of or the implementation of. Um, we have uh, indications which need to, we need to see those metrics go up about youth participation in USG. Uh, funded programs, conferences, uh, et cetera. So those are just a, a few of the examples uh, of the indicators. Happy to work with you and your team if you have other ideas about how we can get more sophisticated, again, in, in being better able to measure that which we intend to change. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I'm gonna to yield to Mr. Reschenthaler and then to our chair, uh, Chairwoman DeLauro. Thank you, Chairwoman Lee, I appreciate it. Uh, Administrator Power, good to see you. Uh, administrators, you know I wrote in February regarding the recent US AID award of $4.7 million to EcoHealth Alliance, which as you know is a nonprofit based in New York led by Peter Daszak. EcoHealth Alliance and Dr. Daszak have a very troubling record of failing to report findings that they get from our federally funded research. They also have refused to cooperate with congressional oversight uh, and I would submit to you that they have collaborated with the Chinese Communist Party to obstruct an objective and thorough investigation of the origin of COVID-19. And just to be clear, Peter Daszak and Ego Health Alliance conspired with the CCP to cover up the origins of the pandemic because they withheld information about the research that was being conducted at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. At the same time, they were praising the CCP's handling of, uh, of the sham World Health Organization investigation and they were parroting inaccurate CCP propaganda talking points. And the, by, the, by the end of the height of the, the beginning of COVID, Peter Daszak was in essence a mouthpiece of the CCP. So with that said, I appreciate the response you gave me to the letter, which came in on the 28th of March, but the crux of my question still remains unanswered. And that question is this, when awarding the organization, Eagle Health Alliance, $4.7 million, did USAID consider EcoHealth compliance failures and refusal to cooperate with congressional oversight, as well as DASIC's collaboration with the CCP. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your engagement uh, on this. Um, first, just because not everybody else might have had the benefit of, of reading uh, what we sent back to you, just to stress that the EcoHealth uh, Alliance Award to which you're referring, as you know, uh, is an award uh, focused on not at all on global public health, but very much on conservation, working uh, with uh, the Liberians to ensure more protected lands, more conservation, training park rangers, creating economic opportunities as they seek again to, to protect uh, public lands. And so in terms of the process, which I think you're asking about, about how that uh, grant came about, which of course we have uh, looked into, 
uh, USAID Liberia has had uh, a long and, and productive history working with the local chapter of Eco Health Alliance, has not had uh, issues related to due diligence or reporting. Uh, you know, I think we've, we've, we've provided pretty substantial uh, grants in the past in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Liberia specifically. Um, but also on land use alteration um, as a driver of disease emergence and climate change, we, we had had productive relations. So when the due diligence was done in compliance with all federal regulations, uh, notwithstanding some of the inquiries and the reporting challenges uh, that you're alluding to, um, uh, again, uh, EcoHealth Alliance in an open and rigorous process was, was chosen. Um, and again, those processes uh, have a lot of integrity to them. So I would still argue that, that the money is fungible and that there's still issues with the unethical uh, behavior of EcoHealth Alliance and Peter Daszak, as well as the non-compliant behavior. Would, um, would you consider an investigation or more oversight into EcoHealth Alliance regarding that unethical and non-compliance, uh, those issues that they have? Well, the issue that you're referring to, uh, again, I believe it's, it's a, uh, an NIH uh, grant and that the back and forth on uh, reporting and so forth, you know, is something that's a little bit further sort of out of my domain. What I can do is certainly assure you that we will be um, scrutinizing, uh, you know, this grant compliance reporting, all, all of the aspects that we bring to bear, you know, in our oversight of grants more generally. Thank you, Administrator. And, and lastly, I just have concerns that USAID is working with, with legacy partners that are frankly inefficient and just as EcoHealth Alliance has unquestionable uh, behavior and practices, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the NIH or USAID, but just focusing on USAID, uh, according to 2021 progress, the 2021 progress report, only 12% of the awards were given to new or underutilized partners. Uh, in fact, only 1% of subawards were obligated to new partners. So with that, instead of focusing on the ineffective legacy organizations like Ego Health Alliance, what steps has USAID taken to work with new innovative partners uh, that would further the mission might be more nimble? Um, I really appreciate that question. Thank you. Um, it's a big priority area for me. I know it's one also for the, the chairwoman of the committee. I think we have made some headway. We've created, for example, something called uh, workwithusaid.org, uh, where you now have uh, thousands of people being able to come and figure out what it takes actually uh, to be able to partner with USAID, which is no easy, uh, <laughs> uh, no easy task, just given some of the paperwork and administrative requirements, which have a disparate impact on new partners, as you're suggesting. I think the localization initiative that I've launched that I alluded to uh, uh, speaks to this as well. Uh, when we looked at this uh, last year, 5.6% of US foreign assistance was going to local organization, the vast majority going to large international organizations or US-based contractors and so forth. So I'm very much on the case. I think the, the again, the, it's, it's a lot about disparate impact um, of rules and regulations that some uh, category of organizations are very easy to uh, find it very easy to navigate or might have Price Westinghouse or whatever as an accounting firm or a GC. And so part of the reason that we uh, come to you often asking for operational expenses increases is a the uh, there has been a lot of attrition at USAID over the years. But B, we want to work with those organizations to guide them through this laborious process because the, tr the startup costs are high, but once people have mastered that process, then they can become the new uh, traditional partner. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. We did exceed our target, I think, of uh, with, with regard to contracting with small business uh, partners. Uh, that is now up to over 15%, which is something, but that's still 15%, uh, leaving uh, 85% uh, with with the larger, more traditional contracting partners. So uh, happy to talk to you or your staff about about more that we can do. But a lot of it is about raising awareness that we're interested in this, and you can help spread that message as well. If you, if, if thank you, Minister, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Lee, okay, on the generosity you. of the time. I okay, let me yield now to our Chairwoman Rosa Delaro. I want to thank the Chair and uh, thank the Administrator uh, for being here today. It's great to have you uh, before the Appropriations uh, uh, Committee.
Um, let me just ask about, with the additional Ukraine supplemental appropriations, as you know, we passed last evening, we're providing additional humanitarian aid in the form of about $5 billion for emergency assistance and agricultural development to people around the world. These are folks who are wondering where their next meal is going to come from as a result of this war. According to a May 5th report from USAID, 5.7 million refugees have fled Ukraine to neighboring countries. 7.7 .7 million people have been displaced across Ukraine. Uh, and, the, uh, and the UN has targeted 8.7 million people to receive humanitarian assistance in Ukraine. So far, it is estimated that we have reached 4.1 million, or nearly half of those in need of assistance. My question, will the supplemental funding for humanitarian assistance that we pass be enough to reach the additional 4.1 million who are in need of assistance? If not, what more can we do? As the number of displaced individuals in Ukraine and across the globe continues to grow every day, how is USID responding to address the ever-changing needs? And how is USAID providing oversight of the funding we have provided and will provide through this supplemental? Okay, there's a lot there, uh, Madam Congresswoman. And first of all, thank you uh, eternally for uh, the significant um, contribution to meeting food needs that the supplemental that you passed yesterday uh, uh, offers. We're hopeful that that will move through the Senate and, and be accessible uh, here shortly, uh, given the scale of need in Ukraine and around the world. Um, let me just say that, that when it comes to meeting food needs in Ukraine, and this comes back a little bit to the to one of the prior exchanges that I had uh, with the ranking member, ranking member Rogers, you know, this direct budget support as well is part of the answer when it comes to to uh, meeting the needs of people inside mm -hmm. Ukraine. So I met yesterday, was it yesterday, could it have been yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday morning uh, with the Minister of Social Services, met last week the Minister of Health, uh, before that with the Minister of Agriculture. We really need to be working uh, really diligently to get Ukrainian institutions solvent up and running. And that's mm -hmm. why that direct budget support, I would view that as of a piece when it comes to meeting humanitarian needs with that four billion uh, that would would take us, you know, it, it, that would meet needs of people inside Ukraine, but is also designed to cover the the collateral uh, catastrophic effects of Putin's war. So that's that's one part of the answer. I think in terms of uh, oversight and accountability, you know, we will be coming back to you with metrics of literally, you know, how many IDPs, you know, have have uh, you know have had cash assistance delivered to them. You know what percent? I can give you those now if you want. But as we go forward with this greater uh, scale of resource being brought online, um, you know what it, it, all of this data is gathered. You know by constituent, how many young people, how many women, etc. Um, but you know I think the one of the biggest challenges with Putin's blockade in the south for the world, but also for for example Ukrainian farmers is how do we get the, the agricultural products that the Ukrainians themselves have planted, now have harvested? It's, it's likely to be as much as 70, 80% of the harvest that they had planned before. They're out there with their flak jackets, their helmets. I mean, it's amazing, the bravery, but they, that the, those agricultural products used to be exported and they used to earn an income by going through the Odessa port and ports and, and other Southern ports. Those are now blockaded. So there's a policy component to this as well, which is figuring out how to get as much out, you know, through, it's a logistic and operational question and a policy question, through rails, through roads, potentially up through Poland and around to the Baltic ports and elsewhere. But this also relates to the security picture as to whether and when Ukrainian resistance is going to cause Putin to retreat uh, fully from, from the reckless war that he has waged. So when you ask me, is it enough, I'll come back to your question, which is so core, uh, the needs are colossal. That's all I can say. Um, for now, it is an incredibly important infusion of resources that will, will be used, again, uh, by our State Department colleagues in, in supporting the effort to meet the needs of refugees, which European governments, of course, are doing an enormous amount on, contributing far more resources through their own EU systems and even to countries like Moldova that fall outside the EU. Um, uh, we are hopeful that they will also be able to inject more humanitarian resources into Ukraine itself, recognizing again how much they're spending on Ukrainians who've come out of Ukraine. 
Um, and But the, the key to all of this is how do we get markets up and running? How do we get agricultural goods flowing? How can uh, the, the Ukrainian institutions that were showing such landmark progress, the very kind of progress that makes Putin insane, uh, sort of return uh, to not only the level of functionality, but, but bringing a level of prosperity that Ukraine had not enjoyed before. We're a long way from that, but we have to walk and chew gum at the same time, meet emergency needs and be rebuilding these systems so that they don't need humanitarian assistance. No one wants humanitarian assistance. It's the last thing on earth uh, any country, especially one as, as proud and capable as Ukraine uh, would want. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me just say uh, again, a thank you and understand that you know, you know from the chair and the rest of the members of this committee, we wanna work with you. Uh, this is an unprovoked attack on a sovereign nation. And there's no reason to cause this kind of chaos and destruction <coughs> and, and human need. And so therefore we wanna play a central role. We, believe that we all believe the United States must play a central role in leading the, the world on this, on, on this effort. So, and we also wanna uh, hear from you and if you get us the specifics that you spoke about earlier, that would be great. And also about how we're tracking the funding and uh, what we will do in terms of, of, of oversight. And I uh, thank you. I know the chair asked about the COVID supplemental, um, but there again, we need to know what the serious consequences are by not putting together a COVID supplemental in terms of what that means uh, as well for national security. So thank you very, very much for your your, your, your time and your efforts and your commitment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I'll yield now to Ms. Franklin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, welcome again, Secretary Power. Uh, good to see you. Or USA Administrator Power. I won't tell Secretary Blinken, it's okay. That's all right. I think you should be the Secretary anyway. Okay, anyway, uh, I listen, I, I wanna talk about, uh, first of all, the violence, the sexual violence against women in Ukraine. I, I almost, it's so horrific what I've been reading that I can almost can't repeat it, but gang rapes in front of their children, 11 year old girls being raped, uh, tongues being torn out of women's mouths. I mean, I, I think I could go on and on. I, I, it is barbaric, it is cruel. Uh, so of course, one of my questions is what we are doing to help those survivors. And I just want to add, as I get on my soapbox, this is an example of how the cruel uh, policies of the Republicans in this Congress not to allow funding for abortions, safe abortions, uh, the ramifications. Hopefully there are other countries that are coming to the aid of these young girls and, and women. But uh, tell us what we are able to do and what we are doing. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. Well, this um, psychosocial support is something we are working uh, with UNICEF uh, in particular and looking again for local partners, looking to see how we can support uh, Ukrainian health ministry, which is normally, you know, in the, in the course of events where, where somebody who's survived sexual violence um, uh, and, and the, the psychosocial and physical trauma uh, and effects of that would go. And that's where, again, getting this balance right between, yes, let's fund the international organization so there's emergency support, but let's very quickly find a way uh, to be tracking assistance uh, to the health ministries where young uh, women or women uh, of all ages in light of uh, just the, the scale of the atrocities here would naturally uh, go uh, in order to seek support. So, so I talked to the health minister about this again last week um, and Atul Gawande uh, met with him in the region in, in, in Poland. And once our mission is up and running, I'll be able to have again more specifics specifically about how we get our support into the health ministry uh, to, to make sure that, that women have a place to go in light of everything that they have suffered. If I may just add, of course, um, this is, part of also the documentary uh, record, the testimony that these women are given uh, about the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that are being committed by, by Putin's forces. And so the other aspect of this is USAID is funding uh, a consortium of uh, around 40 organizations that are a range of everything from organizations that were already doing war crimes documentation because of the war crimes committed in the East and in Crimea from the, the war that began in 2014 
to new actors who are being enlisted in this in this cause. We've, as you know, set up a commission of inquiry uh, through the Human Rights Council. The International Criminal Court has announced that they are opening an investigation. But also, again, our investments in the Ukrainian justice system here are going to be the ones that we've made in the past, but now the ones we are making in the present will aid the Ukrainian prosecutor's office in pursuing uh, national war crimes cases as well, because they've yeah. shown every intention to do that. Okay, that, 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 that's, that is very good to hear. Quick question on uh, education. Keeping, I think I know you agree keeping girls in school uh, is, you know, that is one of the best ways to empower our future generation. Um, I noticed there was a couple hundred million dollar decrease in your request. And could you just explain to me, uh, you know, the reason for that and, and then and what, what efforts you're gonna make to support the girls in school? Uh, thank you. Well, let me just say that we're still part of a global campaign to, to try to press the Taliban to change their uh, horrific decision, uh, one, of course, mm -hmm. that, that preceded the Burqa decision. And so uh, one does not have grounds uh, for optimism beyond the fact that, you know, donor resources that had been intended to flow through UNICEF uh, and other educational partners are now paused by and large uh, as a tool of pressure. Uh, and so that means schools generally are not accessing the resources that they would have if, if the Taliban had made a different choice. But that's not your question. Your question- Well, I guess, is that, does that explain the reduction no. in the budget request? No, no, no because I think we want, we want to live in a, we, we, we don't bank on failure here. We, we are hopeful that if we get the Qataris and, and the Pakistanis and, and other governments that have more, more contact, more leverage, uh, you know, with the Afghan government that we can, we can prevail. I mean, again, we don't have grounds for optimism right now, but it's essential to do so. I think the short answer, honestly, Congresswoman is it's still, you know, 693 million for basic ed and nearly three, uh, 240 million for, for higher ed. Uh, I, I, you know, it's balancing among all of the colossal needs that are existing right now. You heard Ranking Member Rogers' reaction to the budget request as it was, given, you know, the fallout from COVID, which very much uh, lands, of course, in uh, among young people, particularly among, among girls who have not yet gone back to school. We know how important these education investments are. We are just trying to ask for a sizable set of resources that we can expend uh, at the same time, we are meeting underfunded priorities like climate change, for example, that haven't had the resources uh, that they've needed over many, many years. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Now I will yield to uh, Representative Torres. Unmute. Can, can you unmute? Or staff, could you? Okay, got uh, it. Yes, hi, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I have another meeting going at the same time. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman, for um, calling this meeting. And I wanna begin by thanking Administrator Power um, for your consistent commitment to holding corrupt actors accountable in the Northern Triangle. Um, and ensuring that US aid helps local communities. Last year, we spoke about challenges to the rule of law and corruption in the Northern Triangle. You know, sadly, despite strong calls from the international community and civil society, El Salvador is currently in a state of exception, uh, which removes basic human uh, rights. And in Guatemala, the independent judiciary has been decimated with Judge Erica I. I find recently fleeing uh, for her life. We cannot and must not continue to give US, hardworking US taxpayers foreign uh, assistance to governments that misuse it to advance their own corrupt interests and act counter to our own policy goals. Um, this is so important to me. It is a reason why I worked um, on you know, to ensure that the State Department updates and continues to provide Congress that list of corrupt um, elected officials. We must know 
who we are working with, and we must be very transparent about that. <clears throat> so Administrator Power, given these trends, what are the dangers of not vetting uh, funding that goes to governments of the Northern Triangle? And given these risks, how does USAID ensure this funding is not misused and, and politicized? Um, how do we ensure that our aid is supporting those um, who are truly committed to the long-term uh, reforms that they need to do in order for us to reduce the number of asylum seekers at our southern border. Um, you know, th these are efforts uh, that really need to be coordinated across U.S. agencies. Um, thank you so much. If I could just maybe separate out my response into, into two parts. The first, in terms of the work that we are actually doing in the Northern Triangle countries, um, our root causes strategy, as you well know, uh, as I know dialogue with you and your office has been integral uh, to that, along with the collaborative migration strategy. Um, but the, uh, you know, has in it governance and the anti-corruption cause as a central pillar, and I, why, why, why is that surprising? Well, that we obviously have a great interest in stemming migration and in reducing the intention to migrate through our programs. I think there are administrations in in years or decades past that might want to turn away from uh, challenging corrupt uh, actors who turn their back on the rule of law, somehow believing that we can deal with the migration challenge just through enforcement um, or just through a jobs program for that matter or a crime reduction uh, program. We just see it all as intertwined in the same way that you do. So uh, as you know, because I know how closely you're tracking, you know, when you get uh, takeovers, you know, for example, of the Supreme Court or of the Attorney General's office uh, by those who do not respect uh, the independence or the integrity of the rule of law, We've been in a position to have to reroute funding away from those institutions to civil society actors that are holding those institutions to account. Now that is getting more challenging as two of the countries that you've, you know, that Guatemala and El Salvador now are uh, scrutinizing much more the work of NGOs, independent media and others, and really making it very, very challenging for those organizations to do their work. So resources are one thing, but an ability to 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 actually work and and not be the equivalent of kind of disbarred uh, or or deemed illegal because of some new uh, curb on NGO freedom. I mean that is something we have to press on as well. The the second thing I wanted to say just briefly, and I hope we don't have a ton of time, is that you know the anti-corruption cause generally is so close to my heart, so close to President Biden's heart. You heard this at the Democracy Summit, and we've actually launched you know one of the tools that that. Um, corrupt government actors and uh, wealthy individuals, corrupt individuals are using to try to put independent media out of business, not only, I mean, globally, but also very specifically in the Northern Triangle, is the lawsuit against uh, journalists, uh, whether a defamation lawsuit uh, or something of that nature when, when an expose has been published. So we've created something called Reporters Mutual, which is a new defamation insurance fund that will allow those journalists that are uncovering corruption to potentially be insured against those kinds of lawsuits, because it really has been become a, a go to tool in the corrupt leader or uh, or uh, citizens uh, toolkit. And we needed something yeah. to help those actors who are doing the work you're describing. Uh, My time is up. I love to come back with you. And um, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Now I will yield to uh, Representative Wexton. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Administrator Power, for joining us again here today. Uh, the last time you were here with us, I asked you about the administration's plan to restore aid to the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza through the Economic Support Fund. And unfortunately, we're seeing increasing violence in, in the region right now. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention the death of, of a, a Palestinian American journalist last night overnight in the occupied West Bank, uh, Shireen Abu Agla. And it's, it, we don't know really the circumstances of that yet, you know, what exactly happened, but it is indicative of the, of the increasing violence going on in the region. Um, so Gaza is very much still in a humanitarian crisis. And as you know, UNRWA has announced that they may, they may need to, to cease operations over a lack of financial resources. 
Um, can you can you talk about UNRWA's role in the in the region and what the, the impact of aid were again delayed as it was last year? Thank you. Um, UNRWA is actually funded, as you may know, out of uh, State Department PRM account, but I've seen those programs when I was UN ambassador up close um, and just see the, the critical role uh, that UNRWA plays. I mean, in some cases, they, it's not just that they are supplemental school systems, they are the school system for, for young Palestinians um, uh, in, in, in the West Bank and Gaza. And you know there have been challenges with UNRWA over the years again. Um, I pressed hard on that when I was in my, my UN role and again with, with uh, more sort of ju jurisdiction or more day-to-day uh, -day interaction with UNRWA whether on textbooks or on, uh, you know, in times of conflict facilities being used in prob deeply problematic ways. But the core good that those schools have done for young Palestinians, not only in giving them lifelines to economic opportunity ultimately, uh, but, you know, when one thinks about uh, the prospects for radicalization to deprive kids of education as the closure of those schools would do uh, surely is going to be something only the most extreme elements will take advantage of. So uh, definitely uh, caution against that. Um, uh, uh, and, and, have, and can you speak a little bit about the challenges created by Russia's, inv Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how it could impact aid to the region? Because they're very dependent on, on food aid from or food, food coming from, from Ukraine. And I guess that that's, that is really drying up. So can you speak a little bit about the, what that could do to the, uh, to the region? Absolutely. I mean, Again, one can go country by country, but uh, Egypt, I believe, uh, imports 81% of its wheat from Ukraine, Lebanon, 86%. Um, you know, we're talking about economies that already uh, were suffering the, the effects of, of the COVID economic, COVID-induced economic slowdown, uh, maybe just beginning in the case of Egypt to, to, to bring its head above water. Uh, and that, of course, is going to have uh, profound knock-on effects uh, for vulnerable po populations and impoverished communities uh, like those in the West Bank and Gaza. So, um, and it's not just that, it's at the agricultural sector with uh, fertilizer prices going up. The estimates are globally, as you probably know, that 40 million more people are going to be thrust into extreme poverty by virtue of Putin's invasion. Uh, so this gets to my uh, exchange earlier over the additional humanitarian funding that you all have been uh, generous enough to provide in this in this uh, second Ukraine supplemental and my, my hope that that goes through the Senate because we are going to need to plug the gaps. We are also trying to do work, you know, in the regulatory space in it, through our more traditional agriculture programs uh, to try to uh, ensure that farmers are able to produce more with less. Uh, that's very challenging to do on the fly, but those right. programs through Feed the Future and others sure. were, were in place before. Well, thank you so much. And, and you know, you met with Uyghurs about a year ago and you've been outspoken on the ongoing genocide happening in China. I wanna say thank you for your mentioning that in your, in your opening remarks. remarks. Um, I asked Secretary Blinken when he was here recently, um, you know, what, what, how he can better support Uyghurs who fled persecution in China and now are at risk of being forcibly returned to China. Um, and, and where they would face violations of their human rights and maybe even you know, imprisonment and death. So how can we better support Uyghurs who have fled but now are in countries where they, where they, where they, run, a, where they, where they run the risk of being returned to China? Well, I think um, this is, again, a little bit out of my lane, but I, I think that the refugee program uh, that President Biden has sought to, to beef up is, is one answer there, you know, for them to have uh, channels uh, to resettlement to be able to to be referred by UNHCR and and uh, to be considered. So those more robust numbers uh, that that President Biden has has ushered in um, just create more slots for for more, more vulnerable people. I think the core of the answer, though, is um, you know much greater awareness about the genocide. I mean, I travel the world and the debates, the legislation that you all have put in place on the fate of the Uyghurs inside Xinjiang, you just, you just don't hear nearly as much discussion uh, of the plight of these individuals uh, in Europe. So that will be a second dimension of this, just continuing to be vocal. But, but, and then the last thing I'd say is in our diplomatic engagement with any country uh, tempted to, to send back a Uyghur to what is certain, almost certain imprisonment uh, and, and, and a lifetime of detention, right? Because these people are not being 
uh, allowed out of these detention facilities. I mean, these are the, the, this is not a you know you get a, a forced labor and then and then you go back to your community. I mean, these are uh, devastating um, perm means of permanently destroying Uyghur life uh, in China. So so you know maximizing our diplomatic pressure so that those re forced returns do not occur. Thank you so much, Administrator Power. I'll yield back with that. Thank you. Now I would yield to Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Madam Administrator. I uh, am presiding next door, so to speak, at the uh, hearing for HUD, Secretary Fudge. So I appreciate the chance to uh, interject in this subcommittee, which I really value and, and uh, have, have uh, many uh, things that I've heard so far you say that I commend you for, especially that strong defense of UNRWA funding. And also what I understand you said at the, uh, at the outset about um, increasing assistance to uh, the Eastern Europe and Eurasia region, given what's going on in, in, in Ukraine. I have a particular interest in Moldova as the co-chair of the Moldova caucus, as uh, the representative of North Carolina, Moldova's sister state, as uh, chairman of the House Democracy Partnership, where we've engaged with the Moldovan parliament. That is a strong aspiring democracy that is very much in harm's way. And so we passed a Moldova resolution, as you know, in the House uh, very recently, and, and it anticipates the kind of support for uh, Moldova that you, I understand, uh, uh, promised today. But let, let me turn more generally to uh, the kind of support we give to good governance, to democracy development. Um, I, I know you stressed that in your statement as well, uh, in terms of the anti-corruption effort. We, uh, in some cases, of course, like the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we quite, we quite directly incentivize democratic development as a uh, as a condition of our aid. In other in other situations, of course, uh, uh, democratic development, which we consider very much in our in our country's interest, uh, still it exists along other side other uh, foreign aid objectives. Um, so I want to raise the example of Tunisia and and give you a chance to talk about Tunisia, but also the problem more generally. Tunisia is the one democratic success story, we always say, out of the Arab Spring. We have engaged at, at HDP, we have engaged with the Tunisian parliament in very fruitful ways. Yet now we see a president uh, assuming autocratic powers and um, shutting down that parliament and with an uncertain outcome, which we hope, and the Secretary Blinken said a couple of weeks ago, we, we hope and believe is subject to democratic, uh, to diplomatic leverage. Um, well, part of that is your foreign aid budget. And in the uh, budget request, you have 45 million in economic um, aid, but that's nearly 50% less than last year. I assume there's some flexibility on that, some responsiveness to uh, the developments on the ground. But I, I would appreciate your, your comment on what we should learn or conclude from that uh, Tunisia example, and, and also what you would have to say more generally about uh, the way we can uh, use uh, your office and your programs to uh, bolster civil society and democratic forces uh, around the world. Thank you so much, Congressman. And I hope you'll indulge me uh, just 30 seconds on Moldova because, um, you know, when am I going to get the opportunity to talk about Moldova? Um, because it, it just doesn't get the attention I think that it deserves and that the, the incredibly brave uh, risk-taking president and prime minister, both Kennedy School grads, where I used to I used to teach, um, technocrats, anti-corruption reformers, um, you know, women's rights champions. I mean, these are these are leaders that the whole world, the whole democratic world, should be rallying behind. Um, and it's just what President Sandu is attempting in Moldova that Putin is trying to stop in Ukraine. And of course, the economic effects alone, never mind the geopolitical insecurity and uncertainty that a small country like Moldova feels by virtue of what's going on right next door um, with you know, uh, Transnistria occupied already by Russian forces. Uh, we just have every interest in supporting the people of Moldova uh, enact their anti-corruption, their rule of law, uh, their reform uh, agenda. So I, I would sort of link the two because I think you know, on Tunisia, it was the lone bright spot uh, around the Arab Spring. Uh, we have now seen very substantial democratic setbacks. We do not want uh, the same thing to happen in Moldova. There are people, uh, particularly those oligarchs backed uh, by the Russian Federation who'd like to take advantage of this crisis to set back this democratization and integration reform agenda by President Sandu, as you know well. 
Uh, on Tunisia, in terms of just quickly about the the the, the budget, um, I think basically the the funding that we are continuing to do in Tunisia funds the Tunisian people, the private sector, civil society. We continue to see civil societies having a critical role, not only that diplomatic pressure that Secretary Blinken talked about, but that bottom-up pressure. Uh, that A lot of that receded, as you know, in the face of some of these undemocratic uh, actions uh, by, by uh, President Saeed. Um, but, you know, I think we, we look for openings, look to be able to channel assistance, for example, to the Electoral Commission, uh, if there is a good faith effort, uh, you know, to move toward free and fair elections or to reconstitute some of these really important democratic institutions, USA would like to be in a position to be able to support those. Uh, but it is notable that the request is lower and it is reflective, I think, of, of a recognition that some of the kinds of initiatives that we were able to do with previous governments, those opportunities uh, now don't exist in the same way because of the uh, undemocratic actions that have been taken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Now I'll yield to Mr. Espayat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Administrator. Uh, first, let me start by uh, thanking the Chairwoman uh, for her commitment. Last uh, fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill included language that directs uh, the USAID and the Department of State to help uh, uh, Haitian women improve access to health resources. Uh, our committee has expressed that concern, uh, Madam Administrator, uh, about the availability of neonatal and, and, and maternal care in, in Haiti as the healthcare system there has collapsed. Many of the women are forced to travel across the border to the Dominican Republic to get healthcare. 33% uh, of the women at the hospitals or the public hospitals are Haitian women that come across the border. And of course, that also places a great stress on the uh, economy uh, in that country. And so what can we do? What programs are available through USAID to address these maternal health issues facing Haitian women? How can we, this committee, help leverage these programs? Uh, can USAID utilize its resources to help build, for example, hospital necessary facilities uh, for proper prenatal and maternity care for Haitian women. That's my first question. Uh, the second one is regarding Caribbean Basic Security Initiative. As you know, we passed the bill in the House, is now sitting in the Senate. And that particular initiative addresses not only security, but also disaster resilience. It works with the youth in Caribbean countries. It promotes uh, criminal justice reform issues and uh, fights against corruption. So I wanted to know where your take is on that. And finally, I am deeply concerned about the cost of energy in the Caribbean and Latin American countries. As you know, the cost of energy has skyrocketed and many of the leadership in those countries feel that it will unleash civil unrest and violence uh, as items, emergency items, food and other emergency items have really gone right through the roof and are now uh, un unavailable or unaffordable to working class families in those countries. So those three um, questions, maternal care for Haitian women, uh, a CBSI, uh, and, and of course the cost of energy in the region. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, just take a note of all three. Um, so on, I have had numerous conversations with President Binader of the Dominican Republic, as I'm sure you have, um, expressing the same concern, really describing a, a Dominican Republican health system, particularly those, any hospitals near the border that, that um, you know, have, has been, in his words, overrun uh, by Haitian mi migrants, particularly Haitian Haitian mothers, looking as you said for uh, maternal uh, health care. Um, in terms of USAID, I would say we have definitely looked at this because uh, uh, of the need of those those Haitian women. Um, you know, having looked sort of geographically about whether. Uh, you know, hospitals in those areas, because I think President Binodere was stressing the importance of building 
hospitals on the Haitian side of the border. Um, I, I think the, the viability assessments of those were, was that that would not be the, 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 the best place for those hospitals, just in terms of like which communities would take, take advantage of them. USAID's budget for Haiti, you know, is $75 million roughly, um, uh, its development budget. And of course, we additionally provide emergency assistance, you know, often depending on how many uh, humanitarian emergencies befall Haiti in a given year, you know, that number can fluctuate, um, but, you know, it, somewhere in the range of, of 40 to 50 million. I think it is the development banks, like the Inter-American Development Bank uh, or others that one would look to to make those kinds of sizable infrastructure investments. And it's something that we've been uh, engaging with them on, uh, but to my knowledge, again, um, there has not been uptake given all the competing needs in Haiti. It's all and and the the dwindling amount of resources from other countries besides the United States. It's just always uh, challenging, frankly, to be able to mobilize resources at scale. Um, as, and again, especially when it's development resource kind of pitted against humanitarian emergency support. Um, so I don't know, that's not a uh, terribly satisfying response. On the Caribbean Basin uh, Security Initiative, just thank you again for your leadership on that, which mirrors that of, of the chairwoman. Um, you know, I think in general, we as an administration are looking to see what more we can do with the Caribbean. Uh, we, we end up, you know, because they are uh, middle income countries by and large, we USAID end up working regionally rather than you know, through country missions, we have one regional mission for, for all of the Caribbean. Um, but as I, I mentioned earlier, that in my conversations with the Jamaican Prime Minister and the Prime Minister Barbados, and in the run up to the Summit of the Americas, I think you're going to see much more emphasis placed on the Caribbean. I, I, I forgive if this is an inaccurate impression, but my impression as a citizen is that a lot of the leadership for attention to the Caribbean has come from up here, uh, up there, I should say, uh, up on Capitol Hill. I think what you're now seeing in the Biden administration is a recognition uh, of the need to be very proactive here. Uh, it's no secret uh, that the PRC uh, and other actors are you know, making substantial investments. Barbados has, has even uh, done a deal under the Belt and, and Road Initiative. And, and the needs are acute. And finally, just that's a segue to the uh, soaring energy prices. Uh, there are no silver bullets, as we know from our own country and soaring uh, fuel prices here. Uh, but I think out of this crisis, working with countries in, the, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean broadly, but all around the world, to ensure that they are more energy resilient going forward and less dependent uh, on um, uh, supply from, for example, the Russian Federation. Uh, so that's now embedded in all of our programming. Uh, we have a big branded resourced initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa called Power Africa, which you probably know well. We don't have anything analogous uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, but I think if you actually look at the, the budget request uh, for substantial new resources around climate change, a significant core of that is mitigation and uh, helping countries transition to solar uh, hydro and, and other sources of renewables, which would reduce both be cheaper in the long term, but also reduce uh, their dependence, uh, which is part of what's contributing again to this very, very difficult inflationary. Well, period. thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. And I just let me close by saying that there's a general frustration with the access to uh, by these countries to our financial institutions and their ability to address major projects. And that's why countries like China are, are eating our lunch in that region. Thank you again. Uh, we're gonna go now to uh, a three, second round, three minutes uh, for each, uh, in each member. So I'll start out by um, uh, asking a couple of questions. One, as, as it relates to Ethiopia ambassador, um, and mass administrator power. Uh, of course, you know, in Northern Ethiopia, it's dire, uh, including in the Tigray region. Um, and listen, people are facing violence. Can you uh, quickly describe the current level of access for our humanitarian assistance in the region and the status of uh, the humanitarian ceasefire and actions that we're taking, the United States is taking to help resolve the crisis? And then just an overview of the uh, small business and procurement scorecard um, service, uh, disabled veteran-owned small businesses didn't quite make it. Uh, 
uh, I think that we need to know based on um, your contracting goals, subcontracting goals, once again, disaggregated data on which companies are getting uh, access to the contracts at USAID. And uh, thank you again for your workforce expansion initiative called the Global Development Partnership Initiative. And hopefully we'll be able to see more uh, diversity and um, inclusion in, in all of your efforts. And thank you for really revving this up. First time USAID has had such a major effort for diversity and inclusion. And if you don't get to answer all of my questions so we can get to the next uh, member, just uh, send them to me in writing. The record will be open. Okay, we'll do. Um, so I'm, I'm going to eat 10 seconds just on the last question, Congressman, on the, the development financial institutions. We had covered that earlier in the hearing. So I, I very much agree with your structural point that lower and lower middle income countries, uh, you know, the rules are such now that they're not able to access everything from DFC financing to some very important. W no, I was talking about American U.S. small businesses. No, no, no. Uh, Sorry, I was I was uh, cheating and, and oh, okay. providing okay. an answer to the prior That's because he made the it. same point that had been made earlier. Okay. I apologize. Which, okay, but it was it. my response to your prior question, Congresswoman, where I had talked about this okay. structural problem in the Caribbean. Anyway, in in short, uh, 500 trucks a week are needed in Tigray. Uh, a total of 200 trucks when I last checked uh, as of a day ago had arrived since the truce. So that's over around uh, a six week uh, period, not remotely enough. The numbers now uh, that we're hearing are that uh, uh, a million people will face famine like conditions by June, 700,000 of whom in Tigray. So this just underscores, first of all, again, the importance of the assistance that you all have, have now put the, the, the uh, food assistance in this uh, Ukraine related supplemental, but also how important it is globally for us as a government, but also for all governments to be coupling generous assistance of that nature with demands of host government or armed uh, parties for access because assistance without access is assistance in a warehouse. And that is not uh, what the people of, of Ethiopia need or deserve. There's been modest progress again, those we had uh, if I'd been here a month ago, there'd have been no trucks that we'd have been able to talk about, but not nearly enough to meet the food needs. Um, on the the small businesses, small and disadvantaged businesses, I, I would just say um, that it, again, we are. I think we're we're doing better than we're doing better in the real world than we are on collecting the data <laughs> in the disaggregated way that that you are demanding. Um, so I think preliminary data indicates that we awarded more than 14 and a half percent of all contracting dollars to to U.S. small businesses in in FY 21, uh, 5.5 percent to women-owned small businesses, and when it comes to small um, and and disadvantaged businesses, that metric I think we are we have numbers uh, since our conversation yesterday. I, I think that we can we can get to you. We're trying to use the new partnership initiative, um, uh, just this again sustained outreach to local partners, uh, which has incentives to go to new and untraditional partners. So our missions really have incentive to go that extra mile. Um, uh, but again, we're, I know we're not seeing the numbers uh, that you that you or I are seeking. I, I will say also, if you can steer your networks to work with USA.org. That is where we try to walk new partners who've never had the experience of working with USAID through the process and, and give them that kind of right seat, left seat. Um, okay, we'll, we'll follow up with the administrative power and please send you. us, uh, if you can send us a written report, we'd like to look at it. And we certainly wanna work with you to help um, <laughs> expand access to these opportunities for socially and disadvantaged businesses. I'll yield now to Ms. Main. Uh, thank you. And in the interest of time, I'll just, briefly ask my two questions together. Number one, I wanted to ask about Afghanistan, um, you know, at, at piggybacking off uh, Ms. Frankel's uh, comments uh, about education, for example, but I'm concerned also about humanitarian access. Um, we know that uh, there's food insecurity, hospital wards are filled with malnourished children and understand, unfortunately, the delivery of humanitarian assistance has been greatly impacted by the Taliban, especially uh, their limit on the freedom of movement of aid workers of all genders. 
Um, just wanted to ask how USAID is working with US allies and partners to urge the Taliban to allow unhindered humanitarian access to Afghanistan. Um, and I'm sorry, my second question is related to COVID. USAID's Global Health Security Program has a track record of funding zoonotic surveillance and preventing the spillover of pathogens from animals to people in its ongoing effort to prevent pandemics. I wanted to ask how USAID will work with the State Department to ensure that strategic objects are within the scope of a new fund, uh, specifically on preventing the spillover of pathogens from animals to people. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I don't have a ton of time, but on Afghanistan, <laughs> let, let me just say that uh, it, it probably goes without saying, but the United States, of course, is the largest uh, humanitarian donor to try to meet some of the needs that you've identified. And I do think it's a, an extremely dire situation. Um, the U UN appeal for Afghanistan for a single country is the largest ever in the history of the UN for any single country for, for 22. Um, and that's, again, another reason that uh, it's really important that this supplemental that you passed last night go through the Senate because that will provide uh, additional resources for Ukraine and for countries affected by Ukraine, thereby allowing us to dedicate some of our base um, humanitarian funding to, to, to Afghanistan when the need is, is so acute. Um, in term, I think your main question, though, was less about you know, what we're funding. I, I, I would just say that access is an issue, although if you compare it to when you, Afghanistan was experiencing conflict between the Taliban and, and uh, government of Afghanistan forces, um, you know, humanitarian partners are able to get to more parts of the country now than before, but really have to push hard to ensure that women uh, are equal beneficiaries and that women also can work uh, at humanitarian organizations. And as you know, that's not true in a number of provinces where the Taliban have cracked down, and that's a huge, a huge problem and a huge issue. I think the biggest issue in terms of the kind of stunting and, and wasting that we are seeing of, of, of kids is there's there's only so much humanitarian assistance is going to be able to achieve you know fundamentally the country needs liquidity it needs solvency um it needs an independent and functional central bank uh and and the taliban you know doesn't know what it's doing it doesn't know how to competently manage an economy and that is a that is a huge issue uh so uh, again other actors uh within the un system and other governments are are trying to work uh on those issues, you know, we have programs uh, that, that again, try to uh, foster small uh, businesses, help farmers and so forth without providing uh, any material benefit to the Taliban. But, but again, the, the, the core issue is that the economy is sti still in free fall and the Taliban uh, is not putting the welfare of its people first and allowing uh, those international partners who have ideas of, and, and, and uh, mechanisms that could be used in order to stem uh, the, 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 the pain here, um, they are not, uh, they have not proven receptive uh, to those ideas and resources in the way that they need to for the sake of their people. But in the meantime, again, we will continue to provide humanitarian assistance. I don't have time to do justice uh, to your question on pathogens, but maybe we can just follow up offline only to say, um, you know, that, that the, the work that USAID has done over the years uh, to enhance lab um, capacity to enhance surveillance capacity when it comes to hotspots where you have past or likely transmission of pathogens from uh, animals to humans. This work is, is critically important. At the same time, so are the biosecurity and biosafety protocols. Um, and so any work that goes forward there needs to make sure it's sensitive to what you're describing, which is the importance of this work because uh, countries' capacities are not sufficient now, and we know there's going to be more of this as the climate changes uh, and as these uh, pathogens become uh, more prolific. Uh, but but we need to make sure, again, we do so in a manner where the data is managed appropriately and where biosecurity and biosafety pro protocols are adhered to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I will yield to Ms. Frankel. Thank you again. One day, I would love to hear your analysis of lessons learned from our involvement in Afghanistan. But I will not. You do not have enough time uh, with that. Let me just ask quickly. I, we talked a little bit about girls' education, and look, we know that COVID really dis 
uh, proportionally impacted women around the world. Uh, the World Economic Forum estimates it's going to take 267 years to close the gender gap in the economy. Well, it's almost as long as it's going to take here, probably, but obviously women are in a little better shape in our country. Uh, tell me what kinds of things you, that you're going to be doing in, in, in terms to improve women's economic empowerment in, in the world. Uh, thank you so much. Well, um, that, as you know, uh, is a critical pillar of President Biden's Gender Policy Council that he's created at the White House, uh, run by Jen Klein, who I'm sure you work closely with. You know, I think that the this budget request that we put forward uh, is the first budget request, you know, that 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 re that is reflective of the data. Uh, uh, that exists now that has been amassed over the years showing that without women's economic empowerment, we lose, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, every year in uh, global uh, GDP growth. And so it's a $2.6 billion uh, request. And, you know, there are a lot of different dimensions to, to what's captured there, including, including girls' education, but it's also, um, you know, uh, programs that would increase women and girls representativeness in legislative bodies, something you know a lot about. Uh, you know, it is for the first time as part of President Biden's uh, global infrastructure initiative, we have the care economy treated uh, as a pillar of infrastructure. So this is in a sense, the Belt and Road, uh, you know, does these large bloated uh, projects saddling countries with great debt. Uh, we're coming out with digital infrastructure, health infrastructure, climate and clean energy infrastructure, but also gender infrastructure. And so I think within that, if we got the care, some of the numbers right on the care economy and actually saw women uh, who'd like to be part of the workforce, but just can't uh, afford uh, to be part of the workforce because uh, you know there's no normative culture of, of uh, families getting access to childcare uh, at relevant stages, you know, fundamentally, we're not going to be able to overcome that barrier without dealing uh, with without making more investments in the care economy. So I'm, I'm thrilled that that finally is reflected in the budget request as well. Thank, thank you. And real quick, I, I don't know whether there's any negotiations going on in the Ukraine uh, with, with Russia, but I do hope that the administration encourages the participation of women. If that ever does happen. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Administrator. It was good to see you again. Thank you, Ms. Frankel. Now I will yield for our final question from Ms. Torres. Um, thank you, um, Administrator Power. Uh, without the political will from the governments in a Northern Triangle, USAID must prioritize working with capable, credible civil society partners and those committed to reform and accountability, as you well know. Um, as you mentioned earlier, daily, daily there are attacks against those who are carrying out this important work, including arrests and assassinations. So many of the local staff in these countries who risk everything to fight corruption are in jail obta or obtaining asylum because they, are, they dare to speak truth to power. We need to ensure that our commitment to the rule of law and anti-corruption is not just strong words followed by an eye roll, but a real commitment uh, to the people who dedicate their lives to this work. I'm pleased uh, with the initial work USAID is doing to carry out President Biden's uh, presidential initiative for democratic renewal programs to engage and support civil society from the Empowering Anti-Corruption Change Agents Program to the Global Defamation Defense Fund, which you mentioned are such important um, steps forward. Um, I put forward a proposal to create a fellowship to support these local people risking everything to fight corruption and the rule of law. And I appreciate um, USAID's assistance uh, to develop this proposal. Administrator Power, can you speak a little bit more about the importance of US supporting civil society and journalists in the Northern Triangle? And how does USAID support civil society activists and independent investigators? Thank you so much. Uh, well, on all of my visits um, uh, to the region, 
you know, that is my, my first port of call. I never, I never like to meet, uh, with government officials until I've had the chance, uh, you know, to get out and about and to, and to hear from civil society actors. I mean, it's, you know, very country specific. I will say, as you were talking, I was thinking about, uh, you know, for Nicaragua and for, uh, Cuba, we are, you know, we have provided, uh, relocation support. I know that's not your question. We'll come to your question in a second, but, um, you know, and support for journalists who are doing that work out of the country, who can no longer safely do it within. I do need to just look into whether or not that same kind of flexibility exists uh, with regard to our support for independent media uh, in the three northern Central American countries. El Salvador and Mexico may really need that assistance as well. I, I, I think that's that's uh, something that we will we will look at and maybe we'll get just get back to your staff on. Um, I mean, again, the the civil society. I'd have to look at the at the breakdown, but of the very substantial uh, budget request that is coming to you for year two of President Biden's effort to deal with root causes of migration, um, you know, we view this as uh, maybe I've said this to you before, so forgive me, but the three legs on the stool, where you have, of course, economic opportunity, of course, physical security, and 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 being free of violence or seeing violence reduction at the very least. But the third piece of this is having uh, uh, strong civil society and accountable governance. And so, you know, I think you'll see uh, in our programs, and again, we can give you the breakdown for how we train independent journalists. Uh, I'll follow up with your office. I'm sorry to interrupt you. My time is up. I, no, no I, I yield back, um, Madam thank Chair. You. Thank you very much. First, uh, let me thank our members for your very um, succinct and, and important questions. And uh, I want to thank Administrative Power. We are very grateful um, for your service, but also spending so much time with us this morning. Um, I think you know that we all are great supporters of uh, USAID and its critical work for millions of people around the world. So uh, at this moment in our history, uh, we recognize uh, that you have such an enormous task ahead of you, and we want to partner with you in, in whatever way we can. So I once again uh, look forward to any uh, responses to the questions that uh, weren't able to be given, given our time constraint. And once again, thank you again for being with us. Um, with having said that, uh, I wanna remind members that if you do have additional questions, uh, go on and please submit uh, for the record. Uh, I believe our time frame is within the next uh, seven days. So this uh, concludes our hearing. Uh, the Subcommittee on State uh, Foreign Operations and Related Programs uh, stands adjourned. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.